to my right is my friend uh, and, and, and compadre Robert Broussard, uh, who went with me to New York for the horse therapy that we talked about last week. We will be talking about it again. And to my left is a, is a lovely and beautiful, gorgeous, sweet, kind uh, Nellie Harrington. Hello, everyone. Thanks uh, for tuning in to, to our think, show. I think we're going to have a good show. And, and walking up to the set <laughs> is the distinguished professor uh, and computer guru, Richard Phelps, who always has a good insight in, into different things. Uh, and, and, and before we start the show, we always go with prayer. Uh, and, and I would like to say that the prayers y'all have been praying for for my friend that I've talked about, that we can't mention the name, they're doing well. They're starting to move, to have even more movement. So that is awesome. Good. So I'm just glad. I would also like to have prayers for Patsy Bertrand and all her family. Lamar, who lost her husband, Patsy's son, Toby, and, and, and her her kids. And then also say hello to Possum, Robin, Debbie, uh, members of the family, uh, and, and, and also to Janae and Tyler, and to Bryn, who watches the show, I hear, watches the show. I knew Bryn when she was a little girl, now she's a married girl. That's Robin's stepdaughter. So, uh, so anyway, I, I know that family where I grew up with them. So we ask for prayers for them. I ask for prayers for my friend Mike, who works at a, a pawn shop, who had some trouble. We ask for prayers for him. We ask for prayers for uh, Denver Nobles and, and, and Roseland Nobles that uh, they're having some health problems with great people. Then when Rosen run the, uh, a uh, along with Karen and Steve, uh, I forgot their last name. Uh, Dubois. Dubois. They run the NAMI support group where uh, Rosen ro uh, works and Karen work for the, uh, for the pa family members of people with mental conditions and Denver works for the people with mental conditions with which both Richard and I go to and I would also like to say we would also like prayers for Richard's mom uh, Connie Connie uh, we ask for prayers for her she's 90 years old and you know when you get older you need uh, well I need as much prayers as anybody but you know she needs prayers too you know so we ask for prayers, and if anybody would like to, for us to mention anybody that they want prayers on, you could call the show. And of course, we got my name, my number, uh, 781-4255 if anybody ever wants to talk to me. And, and we would like to introduce uh, Brandon Lautier, our, our great director, best director we ever had. Yes. Smart guy. He'll be coming on. He'll, We'll be coming on in a little while. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, I was going to say something. Something came up. Uh, before, like, like usual, when we start the show, we do readings. And, and, and I would like to read Nellie's. Uh, Nellie is a writer, and we're going to have her, book, her books published one day. And I'm going to read what she wrote. To me, midday mantra. The universe knows exactly what I need every moment, and I am cradled in its arms of knowing and adoration. Whatever lies outside of the universe is none of my business or concern. So I tend lovingly to my own garden, and if it flourishes, it is eaten. I know nothing of rotten, only lush fruit and beautiful energies like those of Brazil. Uh, and I bring and hold those energies within my solar plexus and feel the happiness and balance in my solar plexus with every vibration of my being. Lovely, just lovely. That's awesome writing. The new scene, Shanti is dreaming of being in the proximity of the city so close. Now she can actually really feel the enchantment and headedness of the great city and her heart races wild and pumps new life and breath into her body and her arm and leg bands vibrate until they lift her up off the ground and a blue strand of lightning vault begins to decorate and streak the beautiful loving sky 
and the sky embraces the blue blue in the beginning there is no blue in the sky of Lumina and Shanty are smiling as Andrew Lou, he's a horse, comes around the corner first feeling the excitement and when he sees the blue vault painting the sky he screams and rears and lifts and offers his left foot to the sky as Shanty is beginning to her beginning to her feel and hear her wings lift and the steampunk wings white has created for her begins to transform and the aureole lights of her wings rotate and shine a rainbow into the blue vault and five huge raindrops fall upon Shanty and Andalou. Shanty cries and reaches to him. We did it, Andalou. All of our, our, our things have been realized. Shanty reaches out her left hand up to unbind the key of Luminous tied with the red tied with the red string to a braid as it comes free. The key begins to vibrate as the key in Andalou's braid glows. She gasps and a trembling emerald eyes water. She takes a deep breath and then she abruptly wakes from a dream. That's pretty cool. Thank That's you. good writing. Thank you, Bob. You know what, speaking of horses, um, we're supposed to have someone calling in uh, around 8.10. Do you want to give an intro to your your horse um, adventure? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, if, if you can show the pictures, Brandon. Okay, where the, oh, okay. This, uh, this is, uh, like, like, like y'all see this guy right next to me is my friend. Uh, and he's a disabled veteran like I am. And, and, and Robert and I, like we said last week, went a few weeks ago to uh, Albany, New York, to the Saratoga War Horse uh, Therapy, uh, where uh, it's a nonprofit organization assisting <laughs> veterans who are suffering from invisible psychological wounds by providing a confidential peer-to-peer -peer action base equine assisted experience that initiates immediate and long-lasting empowering changes and I can attest to that I'll talk about that later. Saratoga Warhorse offers veterans a three-day experience that has proven to be effective and invaluable for those struggling to adjust to life after military service. The program is provided at no cost to the veterans. Through our connection process, the interactive experience is created between the off-track thoroughbreds and veterans by utilizing the solid language of the horse. Uh, is, this, is that us? That's us on there. Okay. A, a mutual trust and profound bond is established that goes beyond verbal communication. That means you, you connect with the horse in a non-verbal way. Mm -hmm. Our personalized approach provides each individual with a unique experience that helps to release stress. The connection process varies with each horse to veteran interaction, but through careful guidance by skilled instructors, instructors the process remains predictable, sequential, and repeatable. Saratoga Warhorse creates a win-win situation for veterans and off-the-track thoroughbreds by providing an effective alternative method for healing emotional wounds and offering the horses rewarding and meaningful work after their racing careers have ended. Uh, mm -hmm. Saratoga Warhorse provides a new experience with a focus on post-traumatic stress and suicide prevention. That is a vastly different approach from traditional talk therapy. We will try to show some of the pictures. I'm not sure we can. But oh, okay. Well, you can put them on right now, Brandon. Let me talk a little bit more, and then you can put it. There is published scientific data supporting the Saratoga War Horse experience. The process, now listen to this, ladies and gentlemen. The process facilitates a profound personal connection between veteran and horse 
seemingly unlocking a part of the veteran that has been closed off for years. And I'll be talking about that. Researchers are expressing a growing interest in the Saratoga Warhorse mythology and are trying to determine why the connection process is so effective in reducing symptoms of depression and post-traumatic stress, as well as suicidal thoughts. The unique and powerful approach of Saratoga Warhorse has been described by veterans as life-changing beyond words. Saratoga Warhorse founder Bob Neven is a Vietnam veteran who understands the difficulties veterans face long after they return home from service. Racehorse faced a similar transition after their careers and making it difficult to find a new purpose. You know, horses grow to be 30 years old, I think, and racehorses, they'll race till they're about three or four years old, and then they're put to pasture. Through mm -hmm. Bob's vision, Saratoga War Horse is taking action by becoming an integral part of the solution to the growing problem of emotional wounds suffered by military service, service men and women. It's an experience that profoundly changes the lives of both our horses and our veterans. It offers a once in a lifetime experience for those looking to get their life back on track. Families surf, surf, searching for additional resources for a loved one spouse, or spouse hoping for support when nothing else seems to be working and veterans themselves are all encouraged to contact us for more information. That's about the Saratoga War Horse uh, therapy session. And you can show the pictures, Brandon. We're going to show some of the pictures from, from our experience. I think that's some of it back there with the horses. That's me. I, no, that's not me. I don't know who that, that is. No, that's it's, not me. It's that, Tom. Huh? That's Tom. That's Tom yeah. with the horse. Okay. Yes, and and uh, there's some more, this, the stables where the horses are. And, 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 and I must say, uh, it works. It works. I don't know who that is. I can't see with the camera. I think that's you. That's me with that's the horse. Yeah. That's Come me on. with the horse, Nelly. I like that. Awesome. Isn't that awesome? Yes. And, and, oh. and what you do, uh, this is Robert. me and, and Robert. Uh, I have a beard. I look like an old man, man. <laughs> Wearing our Saratoga War Horse hats. <laughs> that's funny. And, 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 and ladies and gentlemen, I would, and, and that's Robert in the snow, it snowed snow. over there. Yeah. It was beautiful, it was, it was a, an awesome experience. And, 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 and what, what you do when you go over there, they, you, you first you go to classes for a morning where you learn about horses and you learn how intuitive horses are and, and how they catch everything with people and, 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 uh, and, and how, tremendously uh, adapt they are at the environment and how smart they are. And what you do, you lead the horse, you get the horse, they bring the horse to you. First, you, you, the trainer picks the horse for you, you know, intuitively what horse you'll best work with. You lead the horse into the corral by a bridle, you unhook the bridle, and then you start running the horse around the corral one way. And if the horse slows down, you have the bridle, you, you hit your, uh, your, your, your thigh with it, and the, the, the horse will continue to go around. And then you cross over, and you make the horse change its direction. Like we learned about horses, Robert. Horses are flight animals, you know? They won't fight, they'll run, you know? And, 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 and for some reason, and then after that, we, we, we call the horse to us, and we, we well, you know, you stop, you, you stop walking around the horse to chase it, and you stop, and you look down. And then the horse, who has learned to trust you, will walk up to you, and, 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 and you will be able to pet it on the, and you all, there's a lot of petting. On, on its face and on, on its neck and everything, hug it and everything. And then you put the bridle on it, hook it up again, and you bring it out. And then they, they, uh, they take the horse and they, you take a picture with the horse, you know. Cool. 
and 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 what what it what it appears to be is just talking, looking, messing with horses. But it has some kind of I'm not. I hate to use the word magical, but I'll say it has some kind of you know because Christians aren't supposed to use magic, but it has a spiritual effect and a, and a healing effect on you. And I've noticed. You know, since I've been processing what happened, like I told you all about having the dream of uh, last time of, of leaving my binoculars outside that my dad gave me at nine years old. And when he found them outside, he just tore into me, grabbed me by the arm, was shaking me, screaming at me. And that's a traumatic thing for a nine year old. And, and the dream, and, and I think the horse therapy brought that back to me. And the trauma went away, you know. And 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 I think other trauma is going away, whether I notice it or not, because I am becoming more and more calmer. And things we got a call. that might be your friend. Ah, uh, it says uh, Michael. Michael Sonny. That's Mike. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, Mike. Hey, Bob. Hi, Hi Mike. Hi. Hey. Guys talking about We're talking about horse therapy and how it's really helped Bob a lot. Mm -hmm. How are you doing, Mike? Hanging in there. Yeah? That's good, Mike. Yeah. Have you been? Have you ever had horse therapy yourself? No, I'm afraid I'm uh, epileptic. I'm afraid I get seizure on one. Yeah. Have you been yeah. to a horse farm at all? Not at all. Mm -hmm. It's very, it'll change. I rode a horse when I was about mid-twenties. I didn't know all the commands. It ended up in a gallop, and my friend had to slow it down. But they're beautiful animals, and God made them. And this is why uh, SaratogaWarHorse.com exists to help veterans. And uh, Robert's going to speak more on it tonight. And Mike, did you have any questions for us tonight? Just calling to say hello. We love when people call and say hello. Thanks for calling in, Thank Mike. You, Mike. We'll talk to you next week. Press the orange button. Bye bye. I just got a few things uh, that I want to share about this. I got some information. Uh, it's called HATS, H A T S, and it's uh, Services of North Louisiana Horse Assisted Therapy Services. Uh, they're wonderful. They're trying to get up a vets program like uh, Robert and, and uh, Bob went to. Bob went to. So, but if you go, this is very interesting. She gave me this link. If you go to path, P-A-T-H-I-N-T-L dot org, and you type in horse therapy, uh, look under find a center, and there are listings across the United States to help y'all find this. And um, there are so many things. There's uh, Heroes for Horses. That one's in Las Vegas. It offers free and low-cost uh, therapeutic programs. Uh, there is a man called Monty Roberts, and uh, he is a psychologist. Uh, he's a famous horse listener, uh, and he has a documentary called Soldiers in Horse Sense, and that's an amazing testimony. Um, and also, Oak Meadow Ranch in Wildman, California, now has free and also uh, paid um, vet programs. And there's also uh, one in Cairn Crow, but I didn't, was not able to get the name of that, but I'm going to give that next week. Yeah, so. uh, Robert went to the, would you like yeah. to talk about it? Yeah, that one was here, uh, it was called uh, StableJourney.com. Right. And uh, so What did you do when you went journey. there? Stable Journey. This one was, it was like a, a two month long program and you actually learn how to ride the horse. Cool. Wow. And uh, it was, it was, uh, the, it was a prototype uh, is their first uh, prototype for the horse therapy. First program doing it. That's they, awesome. They also do, uh, it's at Cherokee Farms, and uh, they also do another program to help kids out, too. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. So, you know, all in all, we're learning, you know, as we go along in this life of different ways to help us as human beings. And this horse therapy is great for veterans. If anyone is interested in it, they can call me at my number, Bob 
at, on on the screen seven eight one four two five five. And if y'all can't reach me, y'all can call AOC and leave a message, and they always give me their messages and leave a number, and I always call back. And I'm not like these people that say I always call back. And then you say, somebody calls, so what? You know, <laughs> I don't do that. I, I try to be as real as I can. And, and I think I, I do a good job of it. So I will definitely call you back if you call me or if you call AOC and leave a message for me. But I will attest to the, to the great uh, change of life it has done for me. And another thing I would like to add, like we, I'm going to be reading my book. A little bit, but it, I have become a better writer. I, I, I'm writing a lot better. Nellie might want to read something yes, that I wrote. I do. Hmm. I notice that since Bob got back and even Robert too, that they're so calm. Their energies are so calm. And uh, Bob started reading his writing since he came back, and it has uh, shifted. It's it's pretty incredible. This is my third book that I've been writing for for, for time. Travel. It okay. was great before, but it's gotten even more interesting. This is, this is when Jared and Susan come back from a trip, and their parents have gone. Uh, the, the Jared's dad, Robert Borg, has built another bigger time machine, and he has taken both his wife and his daughter into the past. Wow. And, and, and this is where Nellie's going to read. Okay. It says... Please do not tell anyone about the time machine without our consent. Yes, sir, I won't tell anyone about the machine unless asking your permission. Maggie humbly responds. Then she looks at Jared and what he got from President Ram and the doctor reveals a wrist intergalactic radio to Jared, which is similar but which looks a little more sophisticated than Jared is. Jared's is, I'm sorry. Jared then looks at the wrist radio after the doc takes it off with the doc saying, with this radio we can communicate with any planet who has a similar device like Quator and Atlantis, who also just got one. But that is not all. The wonders of this extraordinary radio are not only can we talk to other planets and each other, now the doc goes on, but with little readjustments with the tools and equipment I got from the Quartanians, I can adjust your wrist intergalactic radio so that we will be able to talk to each other no matter where we are and no matter what time zone any of us are in. Excellent, Jared says, and takes his radio watch off and gives it to his dad and says, go to it, dad, I won't need it for a few weeks. Then the doc says, I should have adjusted it in about two weeks and we can communicate with each other from now on in any time zone we are in. Okay. I'll that's cool. The, the rest later. Okay. okay. Sage of Dick Tracy. Yeah, I want one of those wrists. Yeah. Uh, let me read. Let me read uh, my book from my book. Uh, this is when I, uh, I, I learned about Jesus and met Mike Fusilier. Uh, uh, and and the, Mike Fusilier is a, is the guy. Is a councilman in St. Martinville. He's a he's a, a, a he has a ministry of helping people and and teaching about the Lord. And he has even has a a, a Bible study on Tuesday nights at his house in St. Martinville. Well, Mike is a guy that led me to the Lord when I was smoking five four packs of cigarettes a day, drinking a case of Diet Coke a day, and half out of my mind with grief and depression and fear, hearing voices and people treating me like dirt, you know. And and this is this is where I met Mike. This is a description of Mike. Mike was married to a beautiful girl named Tina who had always been kind to me, even when I acted strange, and I've acted strange already. <laughs> with my condition. She is a very level-headed and kind person and is a good match for Mike. At the time I started talking to Mike, Tina had just given birth to a baby daughter and I usually gear how long I've been saved by her age as she was an infant when I started coming around. Her name is Brittany and she's a registered nurse out of New Orleans. She also has a brother named Gabriel who will graduate from Catholic High, yes, since graduated, 
uh, in the New Iberia where I went to school. He's a very good wide receiver, and as, as, as I think I've heard, is the fastest white boy in the state of Louisiana. Now he plays for UL. Of course, I'm not sure if it's just in his school level, which I think is 2A, or maybe he's the fastest of all, out of all Louisiana schools. All I know is that he's got a bright future in football, and like Britton, is a very good kid. Kudos to you, Mike and Tina, on your child, uh, bear, bear, uh, child rearing. Anyway, at the time in my life, I would wait for the, okay, a few times I would wake Mike up, sometimes at midnight or one o'clock in the morning, and he would take the time to talk to me, telling me that Jesus really loved me. Although I was really heartbroken over my situation, his talks gave me peace, and I was able to go home and, and sleep. I woke Mike and Tina up more than once, and Mike graciously would talk to me about God and Jesus until, and the Holy Ghost until I finally gave my life to God. And from that point on, my life hasn't been the same. That's interesting. That is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and also I would like to say to you people out there, me and Robin and Richard are going, Mike Fugile is having well, his Chico uh, revival. Uh, uh, men's retreat. Men's retreat. In Chico State Park on the on the uh, February 13th, 14th, and 15th at Chico State Park. February 13th, 14th, and 15th at Chico State Park. And if anyone would like to know about it, they can call me at 781 4255. And also, I'd like to say our friend Denver Nobles is going, as well as some of the guys from St. Morgan, besides Mike, like Mike B. Avenue. Jared Flanders and a few others. So it, it is always a great time. We talk. We have we have people that talk about the Lord. We have uh, we have teachers. We uh, on Saturday night we all have an inch or an inch and a half thick uh, barbecued ribeye, which is absolutely delicious. Yeah. Space is filling up fast. It's already two thirds full. So it's about only right. got about another two uh, weeks to register. I don't know where that no, is. she would have been calling on this number. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to uh, to tell everybody out there. Um, at eight thirty, we had promised that we were going to show the art of bar and not the drawings, but we're having some technical issues, and so uh, we had the same sort of issues last week. We're working them out, the bugs. And if you tuned in to see that specifically, I apologize. I promise we're gonna we're gonna have that next week. And um, I'm just going to share very quickly um, some things with you about the heart math. Uh, we've been going through over that each week for those of you that are tuning in to continue with that. If you have your journal ready, we can get started with that. Um, this says, remember, this is not about relaxation. It's about turning down the volume on overwhelm, anxiety, or frustration. For example, shifting into more balance. I actually had to utilize this today because my frustration levels were through the roof. And so it's really helped me a lot. So um, if you're having any issues, you can work through this. You know, the more we practice these things, the more they kick in when you need them. You don't have to think about it. They just automatically will come to assist you. Um, the quick steps are number one, heart focus. Number two, heart breathing. After you have learned the steps of a technique, Quick steps or an easy way to remember them. Inner ease technique. The inner ease technique will help you achieve what heart math calls a state of ease. Now the state of ease is not about moving at the speed of a snail and it is not sleepy time relaxation state. It is about slowing down your inner body language. The mechanical, mental and emotional reactions that create mistakes, compromise friendships, and drain energy when we feel frustrated, angry, or impatient. It helps plug leaks while also recharging your inner battery. Using this technique is a key way to sustain your energy and flow through the challenges of day-to-day -day events with more ease. If you are stressed, acknowledge your feelings as soon as you sense that you are out of sync or engaged in common stress reactions such as anxiety, overload, 
anger, frustration, mental gridlock, being judgmental. This step can be the most difficult because stress often goes unnoticed or unacknowledged. Identifying an out of sync feeling is very important. So take your time with it. You might write it down in your journal and put what time you started the heart math. And then when you finish the heart math process, then uh, at the end of it, you put you know your feelings. It's very helpful to defrag to write your feelings down. Take a short time out and do heart focused breathing. Breathe a little slower than usual and imagine you are breathing through your heart or your chest wall area. During heart focused breathing, imagine that with each breath you are drawing in a feeling of inner ease and infusing your mental and emotional nature with balance and self care from the heart. When the stressful feelings have calmed, affirm with a heartfelt commitment that you want to anchor and maintain a state of ease as you re-engage in your projects, challenges, and daily interactions. And when people didn't see my smile today, my friends and my son all said, okay, what's going on? And I didn't pretend, you know, I, I didn't say nothing and just tuck it in. I let it come out and I say, thank you for caring and being compassionate and I'm very frustrated. And they just kept supporting me and I feel so much better. I like to say thank you to them for the support. So don't be afraid to reach out. We're human. We have these emotions for a reason. They're trying to tell us that we need to get on another path. Thank you, Nellie. You're welcome. Uh, so I'm trying to turn my red, my see my phone off. I keep getting a call. I don't know if it's a prank call or not. Okay, pop well, off. Well, would you okay. like? Okay, it's uh, going off. Yeah, you know, well, I'd like Richard to do his segment right now. Yeah, Richard, go ahead. Good? Rich, you know we we have, we have decided. We have decided. We have decided that we're going we're gonna to all do each segment of the show, you know, to, to make it a more of a variety of information that we all give. So we've all given each of us a few minutes to talk about what, what, what concerns us and what we, what we would like to share with the public. And we're going to let Richard go on. Nelly has just talked. We're going to let Richard go on. Okay. Richard's going to talk about dialectical behavior. Say that right? Dialectical behavior therapy. All right. It means two opposites, and you merge something together from those situations. And basically, there's a book that I highly recommend called Dialectical Behavior Therapy Skills Workbook. We're going to try to get a copy next time. We didn't have time tonight. But it talks about the emotional tidal waves or tsunamis that come in life, be it a loss of a family member, loss of a job, some kind of personal attack that you've gone through, or you know, trauma and war, whatever it may be. And the book is structured to help you build an emotional resilience. You've got tools in there you can develop, and this is why I like the horse therapy so much. That that could be one of the tools that could be mentioned in a future edition. These are tools you can get and it takes time to learn. These aren't overnight by any means. Do you have an example of what kind of tools? Well, let's say you run into a situation where someone's trying to argue with you. Mm -hmm. You got two choices, fight or flight. And you don't want to end up arguing. You want to either change the topic or if you all can't agree, just quietly say, could we discuss this another time? Diffuse the situation. Well, wait, that's what you do. you've been doing to me lately when I've been calling you, uh, mm -hmm. pressuring you about stuff. Now, that's awesome, Richard. That is <laughs> awesome, man. <laughs> so the second point that you wanted <clears throat> to make, is how do you build up this uh, resiliency? Richard? Well, there are some tools that are common to some of these other therapies, such as the deep breathing, take a deep breath, four seconds in, hold four seconds, four seconds out. That's one technique that you can do right away, especially if you have a stressful job like computer work or a high stress job in a very busy environment. Take time out every five minutes, every hour, so you're not so stressed up. 
there's another tool you can use and that's find an activity that's distracting but a healthy distraction let's say go outside and walk if you if you've been just hunched over on something and get getting into it too much that's another activity can you think of another one Nellie that would be good um EFT the tapping uh, emotional freedom technique is very good you don't even have to do it um, you know physically if you don't want to and the minute that you feel it you just um, imagine in your mind that you take your hand and you tap on a part of your body uh, and you just say in your mind I am calm I am calm I'm okay you know it's okay uh, I am calm and you just sort of if anything you can do just to shift that focus away from that anger and that feeling of that's coming up you know uh, that sometimes it's not even the person that'll you know get you there it's just that you've got to shift your focus and get it off of there and the breath the tapping you know you can just do it gently nobody ever know you're doing you know you could just mm -hmm. sort of like take your hand and put it by your heart because the friction building up in your heart builds up cortisol and it's not good for you to hold that mm -hmm. um, it's bad for your heart it's bad for your blood pressure so anything you can do to assist your body your blood pressure to come back down to calm by shifting that that focus um, that's awesome Richard um, Richard's gonna uh, have more uh, on his next segment next week and um, speaking of things for therapy and shifting your focus, I just want to share uh, something that Brandon uh, um, is a wonderful uh, director. Uh, he, he has found his niche, but he is also an amazing chef. And so a lot of times what we do uh, for therapy is we cook and we cook together at home. And he has come up with this new recipe and we wanted to share it. Brandon's going to be coming up. Uh, with his own uh, cooking show very soon and we're very excited and we all want to support him with that um, This was the last uh, Meal the dish that he made um, and he, he gave it the name of stew boat How'd you say it Brandon? Stew boat casse. It was so good and mm. to show you that it's basically a uh, potato stew but he made it more like a, a like a gumbo and a fricasse and a stew all combined together it was incredible so thank you brandon for you know let, huh i can't hear you uh yeah you can put it yeah or is this a picture of the art no we can't we can't show the art this week this this is just a picture of um i had a, a workshop called the healing handkerchief and I wanted to share this last week. We talked about uh, Linda Thibodeau and, and about some things, the healing techniques that we use to help her. And her report this week was she's still not having inner pain in her back. And so we just want to say a prayer for everybody now, like we do at the beginning of the show, and say, if you watch and look at the handkerchief and just pour any pain or anything you have into the handkerchief, and we're going to ask that you have the same uh, relief of any pain that you're experiencing, uh, the same as Linda. She said to tell everybody hello and thank you for all the support. You know, we try to support everybody in the community <laughs> and offer them whatever help, you know, that we can. And many times the prayers and just the compassion and the nurturing, you know, which is something that we thank Bob for, too, because he's provided this through this show for almost 10 years now in this award-winning show. And uh, we say kudos to Bob and thanks to AOC for the platform. And, and I think, Bob, didn't you have something that you wanted to share about loneliness? And yeah. Are you but gonna before, read out of your book first? We, I'm gonna read out of my book first. This okay. is my time traveler book, my science fiction book. The first of three books. Uh, oh. This is, what, this mm -hmm. is, the, this is uh, they're in the time machine. Susan asked Jared, is that where we are going? Yes, Jared replies as the wormhole disappears and the machine starts spinning ag again with the strobe light effect of light today gone until the time machine comes to a complete stop in the woods near McKinley's Ferry, the crossing point wherever Washington's troops will camp. They're going to see George Washington. Jared has set the time and ge geographical location to the ferry landing in New Jersey for December 25th, 1776. 
They found themselves in a wooden area where Jared pulled the machine out of sight, having covered it with branches. Then he and Susan, who were about a mile from the ferry where Washington's troops were camped, started walking in their period costumes. When they came upon the campsite, they were addressed by some of Washington's <coughs> soldiers who questioned them as to their whereabouts. When Jerry said they were scouts and were there to see the general, that after being searched, they were led to the general's tent. When they walked into Washington's presence, he looked at them with surprise and said, I don't know you. Who are you? It is then that Jerry says, it is what it is, let things venture where they may, you do the right thing, remember, manifest destiny. At that same, Washington kicks out all of his personnel from his tent, sits back and offers a cup of some wine. That's from the, the time machine. How does, how does that sound, Richard? Wow. You're taking people through so many periods of history that a lot of our people have forgotten about. Yeah. And then, then I would just like <coughs> to also say before I read this that writing and journaling me and Nellie and Richard are all writers mm -hmm. Richard's working on his his sci-fi book that we're gonna help him uh, do and we're gonna do Nellie's book so we got we got a lot of projects in the making if Robin wants to write a book we'll help I him you started journaling that's awesome that's awesome awesome so anyway, it works, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. But let me read a little bit about, you know, we like we're going to all have our own subject to talk about. We all have a few minutes to talk. And let me read this about isolation and loneliness, which is a big problem in society in any walk of life. When we, are, when we start feeling isolated, we have may, may have thoughts of not be belonging or feeling rejected by others. What we overlook, however, is that when we are alone, we are often in the company of our worst enemy, the one within ourselves. An isolated space is the perfect breeding ground for negative set official critical thoughts. These thought patterns make up the critical inner voice, an internalized enemy that leads to self-destructive thought process and processes and behaviors. This inner, inner critic feeds into our feelings of isolation, encourages us to avoid others and remain in a lonely state. Feeling lonely can trigger voices that we are unloved or unlikable. These reflect a, a hostile and unfriendly point of view toward yourself. Treat these voices like they were coming from an external enemy. You know, just try to let them go in and out and do not tolerate them. I guess it takes practice. Oh, yeah. Literally tell them to go away and that you refuse to buy into their destructive messages. Like me, for instance, with the schizophrenia. When I think I'm hearing voices and everything, which schizophrenics do, you know, hallucinate with voices and everything. When, when I'm in a bad way, I just say, I've been dealing with this illness for 45 years. I just slough it off. I, I, I have gone, grown to know when they're not real and when they're just thoughts. But anyway, it is important to always act against any thought, thoughts that people don't like you. We all do that. Are there ways you act that are based on what your voices tell you? For example, do you attack yourself for being awkward or creepy and then act quiet in a group of people? Then does your voice turn around and criticize you for acting that way? Your critical inner voice can generate self-fulfilling prophecies. It will try to keep you from challenging yourself and then stab you in the back for avoiding taking action. Your CIV will almost always try to prevent you from struggling through uncomfortable situations and ultimate feelings at ease with yourself. When you challenge your voices, don't be surprised if they temporarily become stronger. Remember that if you are persistent in counteracting your attacks, they will ultimately, ultimately become weaker and even go away altogether. You may still hear them, but they will feel less intimidating and have less power over you. But anyway, this is the end of it. No matter what their sources, 
the source voices that you are unlikable or much harder to accept when you're around people who are like you as support. When we hear these attacks, it is vital that we do not allow them to manipulate our behavior. Acknowledge your feelings of loneliness and isolation without judgment, saying to yourself, I feel isolated right now, so I'm not going to give in to my critical inner voice. Make your actions meet your words, and don't put yourself in an isolated position. Uh, you know, and, 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 and talking about that, you know, like, like I always talk on the show, I'm always by myself. Well, I, I have, uh, you know, I, and I go to, me and Richard go to the support group of NAMI, and Robert goes too sometimes. And, 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 and we, have, we have done something about that, you know, because Richard and I have joined Oceans, a mental health uh, organization, and we go to what's called IOP. What does IOP stand yeah, for? Well, I have to, we can't really name it, but the term IOP means intense outpatient therapy, but there is something I picked up that segues right into what you're discussing about emotions and isolation. It's called the emotional mind, imagine a circle with my left hand, the rational mind, the right circle, and if you move those two circles together, there's an intersection. For those that were in grade school, it's called a set diagram or a Venn diagram, but the middle part where they intersect is called the wise mind, and we're going to amplify on that next week. Awesome. But I thought it was a really easy illustration to remember when, on the one hand, your emotions are flying all over the place, something has just happened very disruptive. You're trying to figure, you know, your emotions are doing it, then your intellectual side of your brain is trying to analyze it. There's a way to bring those two together. And we're learning how to do that now. We're not really supposed to mention where we're, these are like classes, okay? Yeah. So we really can't mention the facility, but it's an excellent program. The whole concept of intense outpatient therapy is an alternative to hospitalization. And we had it highly recommended. There are many people going there. We can't mention names. That, that's just the rules they have because people are coming in from all different backgrounds, mm -hmm. but they have excellent staff. Yeah, and, and I went, I went and Richard went the other day and we like it, you know, and, 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 and that's good, you know, like I was talking about isolation, being by yourself and me, myself, being mostly by my, you know, Richard has all tons of friends to talk to, but I, I just, I have mostly Nellie, Richard, and Robert that I communicate with. So, you know, I'm going to be around more people. And, and, and it, it's just funny, when you're around human beings, there's chemical changes taking place. Right. And the serotonin, even whether you have verbal communication or nonverbal communication, it's good. Okay, Nelly, you want to? You okay, to? Uh, Brandon, can you put the pink moon up, please? Um, one thing that I do uh, to deal with my post-traumatic stress disorder and the other things when I, as much as I can possibly, um, to keep my mind occupied and let my heart flow out, uh, defrag, and, uh, is to write songs. Uh, and in my book, uh, Shanti, who is the main character, is on tour right now, and she's a songwriter, and she's uh, doing really well with her songs. So she's just finished this new song, and I'm going to sing it. And awesome. Awesome. I hope you like it. Bob's already heard this when I sang it and ran it by him, and he liked it. All right. And it's called My Secret Heart. So you found me here, waiting just to hear the sound of footsteps making their way to me. As the morning sun falls upon my face, you reach for me and take my breath away. And my secret heart turns from stone to diamond sparkles and begins to pound. For you found the hidden key, the
Though my secret heart trembles and feels so insecure, I can't hold back, there's nothing I want more, for I do love you. So you've found me here, waiting just to hear the sound of your voice, hearing you call my name. As the morning rain falls upon my face, you take my hand and sorrow melts away. And my secret heart turns from stone to diamond sparkles. And begins to pout For you found the hidden key Free my sacred heart Break down the walls we built along the way I will be yours if you will only say I love you I love you with my secret heart. That's fabulous. Wow. That could be that could be a record. That's Thank gonna be you. a record. Wow. That Thank could you. be a record. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nelly. You're uh, welcome. That could be um, a song. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Thank you. Uh, uh, when we were when we were asking for prayers, I forgot to ask for prayers for Miss Jackie Ballou who has been a great help to our show. Our underwriter, she buys our membership. She, she gives uh, generously to AOC. She's a, uh, she's a Christian lady, great lady, and she's been uh, like an angel to me, and I love Miss Jackie to death. And she puts up with me. Oh, so. she takes good care about Thank you, Miss Jackie. We love you. We love you, Miss Jackie. We look forward to saying hi to you every week, and we think about you and say prayers, and we're so grateful for you. Yeah. And then Miss Jackie has a son, uh, Peter, and his wife, Carla, and, 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 her, and her two grandsons, Zach and uh, Jason, uh, you know, good kids. Uh, Jacob, two good kids. Okay, I promised that I was going to finish reading up your story. Okay. And, okay. Let's have some pie, Henrietta then says. We pick up an apple and lemon pie from Francesco D. Gio Gandhi. Gio Gandhi. Oh, wow. In 1501 A.D. Listen to this. This is so awesome. Where his wife, Lisa, you know, made the pies for us. Gasp, Jared, who can hardly talk, expand, says, You mean you went to see Leonardo da Vinci in Florence and Mona Lisa made pies for you? Yes, <laughs> Henrietta says, Now let's eat before the pies get cold. Then they all leave the doctor's work study and sit down to enjoy the succulent pies baked by Lisa. Geraldine, or as she is known by history as the Mona Lisa. This time, instead of eating in the dining room, everyone sits at the kitchen table and eats their pies. They all watch That Girl, a comedy about a young girl starting out in New York City, starring Marlo Thomas, Danny Thomas's daughter. How is Leonardo? Jared then asks. Our Florentine friend is doing quite well. In fact, the doctor says he painted a picture of Maggie wearing a 16th century dress with her hair in curls. Thanks to the expertise of Lisa Geraldine, or Mona Lisa, as we call her. Look, here it is, and Henrietta brings a portrait to share with Jared and Susan. Wow, you look beautiful, Maggie, Susan says and goes on. That dress is looking good with the black corset tightening your tiny waist. Where did you get the diamonds around your neck? We're going to stop, and I'm going to continue this next week because I know that we're running short on time, and I think that Bob has some more things that well, he wanted to talk about with y'all. Well, uh, you know, like, like, like I can't say enough about writing, you know. Uh, I, I, that's what I, I, you know, I'm beginning to think people might be right. I might have the gift, you know. <laughs> and, 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 you know, from Nellie as well. 
my, my, my champion uh, uh, backup, you know, my, my best, my greatest fan, her and uh, Jenny uh, Pruden. What's it? Yeah. Peron. Peron, you know, uh, are my two greatest fans. They're reading my third book. And, 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 and I just, I'm just getting, you know, it's like you start off slow. You take baby steps, like Richard says, and you get more and more proficient, which goes with anything, like exercise or trying to defrag your mind or, or, or trying to get a relationship with Jesus. The more you try, the better you get at it. So if you're out there and you want to try something and you're scared because it's hard, just start taking baby steps exactly. to do it, you know? Right, it's like stretching, okay? You stretch your body. Uh, stretching is wonderful. If you can't really exercise, I don't really exercise at all, but I use my stretching. And there's a great one that I want to share with y'all very quickly because if you take your hand and you put it in just... Gently come down. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We finished. Bye-bye. God bless.